Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. Hanging here with the chicken man. As he says, this is uh, Chris Berg. Chris, how you been? I'm doing good. Good. Nothing like an informal flying start. So go ahead. You're, you embrace the chicken label. Well, I was just saying that, you know, I love doing this for the kids. You know, uh, yeah. I'm not making a, I'm, I'm not becoming a millionaire writing charts, putting out records, going around and working with students. But it's what I love to do, and I have a blast doing it with the kids. So it's for the kids. So for the people who don't know the chicken reference, what, what what's yeah. the deal? Uh, okay, well, the short story long. Um, <laughs> back way back when I was in college, I did an arrangement of a tune called "The Chicken," which was written by a member of the James Brown Band, Alfred Pee Wee Ellis, and uh, and Jocko Pastorius embraced that tune, became a, a tune that he played like everywhere he went. And, uh, and, and there was a big band version that he recorded first on an album called Invitation, and it wasn't available. So I did a pseudo transcription slash arrangement of it. And that was when I was in grad school. And then in 2001, we published it and it's gone on to become Huge. one of the, the handful of best selling big band charts ever. Um, and it's, and it's, not because of my talent as a writer, but because it's the choice of the tune yep. and it's such a fun tune and, and it still sells almost as good as my, my new chart some years, mm -hmm. and which is really what makes it crazy because normally in the, the educational marketplace, as we call it, uh, you know, first couple of years are your big years and then you dwindle in a, a handful here and there. And this thing just sells, keeps going every year and and i'm just blessed and grateful by it but because it was so popular uh my you know uh what is it imitation is the sincerest form of flattery so right. i like to flatter myself so that's right <laughs> who so, is that who oh, do you keep talking oh your daughter hey she daughter we're recording all right oh okay we'll, we'll that's keep okay that in there. that's um, all right so uh, but but basically my editors had me write a chicken based a chicken themed funk song ever since every year yep i you know we're going to talk today about number 23 i think 23 chicken songs so i mean some of them are hilarious some of them are better than others when it comes to the title right okay i was gonna I, say no i mean <laughs> some of them are better than others when it comes to the song too <laughs> yeah i wouldn't <laughs> um is uh, my my personal favorite is hanging with the peeps I, oh there just, you go that's just one i like i don't know that um, was a uh, a t-shirt i saw one christmas doing an all-region band in late november and this kid it had a big picture of one of those marshmallow peeps on it and it said hanging with my peeps and i was like bam there's a chart title and i keep them on my phone i have i got another 20 titles to go you know really yeah so you know so every year when you do one um you just they're all funk tunes right except for this yeah newest they're one. all this newest one's all... the second line tune the new one is a second line, which is kind of a New Orleans funk kind of groove. Yeah, you're, you're you breaking know. the breaking the mold. Yeah, there you go. Well, my mother always wanted me to write something called a rose con pollo, and and make it a Latin chart. And I'm like, thanks, mom, I love you. And I gave her a big hug. You know. <laughs> so I had a question for you. What is okay. um? So you're like you're you're a bass player for people who don't know who don't know. I am um by trade. So is that sort of where you um, sort of have that funk, uh, background. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, but it doesn't matter whether I'm writing a funk tune or whether I'm writing a swing tune or, or something. Um, I, you know, kids ask me all the time, you know, how do you start a chart? And for me coming from sitting in the bass chair, I typically start at the bottom and work my way up. Mm -hmm. So I'll come up with a groove or a set of chord changes or, uh, a funk line or something like that. And, you know, if it's a funk bass line and I'll, I'll put that down and I'll come up with some chords to go over the top. And once I get kind of this section of a groove going or whatever, then I start singing melodies in my head and figuring out, you know, what, uh, what, what I think works well, you know, yep. that kind of thing. So, so I know a lot of, I know a lot of players that start at the top, they come up with, you know, but, and I, think they tend to be more your melody type players your you know your trumpets and sax players sure. who are arrangers you know 
So I got a couple questions that I don't haven't prepared you for at all, but I'm going to try. That's it. okay. I, um, I we haven't prepared me for any of these. I don't think <laughs> we're um, going totally off the fly here. This is this is all. No, go ahead. Got it. Um, if kids, if people are looking for a young kid who is going to start as their bass player, what what yeah. are the couple uh, traits they need to have in order to be a good bass player? Um, a fairly decent sense of time. Yep. But and and I will tell you my philosophy on time because i talk to drummers and bass players about this all all the time um you know what perfect pitch is right i do obviously okay yeah. do you know what relative pitch is i think so well the way i always learned what i'm saying what, what i'm calling relative pitch is the ability to sing any pitch from another pitch okay so if i play a middle c on a piano i i could you know if you go here comes the bride i found f but it's not perfect pitch mm -hmm. because I didn't just find F out of my head. I found it from another thing. It's relative pitch. Okay. And, and, and you can develop a, a relative, a pseudo relative pitch, perfect pitch idea, because if you just, every time you go by the piano, you plunk a middle C and you memorize that sound in your head, then, you know, you can pretty much, so you can kind of develop a fake perfect pitch. Yep. I think, I think there are people born with perfect time, cool. just like there are people born with perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. But most of us, like most people, don't have perfect pitch. Most of us don't have perfect time. But if your your bass player will be ahead if they have a relatively good sense of time to start with, and then you put in the metronome time. I mean, yep. years. I I would teach my students when I was teaching college. I want you doing everything with a metronome. I want you chewing cereal with a metronome. I want you practicing your scales with a metronome. I want you doing everything with a metronome. So you start to, you need to get to the point for me where you're uncomfortable when things are rushing or slowing down. Yep. It bothers you. And then, and then you learn how to fix it. So that, and I think, uh, I think a bass student uh, has to have, I don't want to say they have to be a jerk, but they have to have the confidence to say I'm right. And uh, especially in a big band and the other 16 of you over there, you're wrong. I like it. You know, the drummer and the bass player got to have that kind of confidence. So a lot of times, some of the hardest things to do when I do clinics or when you've got that shy, quiet, soft-spoken bass player who, plays the same way they they are personality yeah. wise and that can be a problem when you've got the soft-spoken bass player who doesn't play like that who plays like you know i'm in your face yep listen to me i'm the man that kind of thing that's a perfect combination because then you're not dealing with all that ego but they need to kind of play like they have an ego i also i also like the fact that bass players and drummers have to do it together because sometimes yeah. You know, if you have a stronger drummer but a weaker bass player, it's not ideal. But sometimes, if your drummer is a little bit weaker but your bass player can can lead the drummer, obviously that's not ideal. But you know, people no. need to think of people need to think of the bass player as being equal to the drummer when it comes to the time. Absolutely, and 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 I find that again, mo most of my what I do now are are all states and all region kind of things. So I'm with the kids for two days. If I've got a a, a weak drummer or a weak bass player, I'll make that rhythm section work because one can help the other get stronger even in a couple of days. Yep. If they're both weak, whoops, then you got more work. <laughs> you just got yep. more work to do. Yep. Where it can be a problem and I was actually in a rhythm section like this in college where the bass player and the drummer were both extremely confident and capable players and it never it never gelled hmm. because they just didn't work well with other they didn't play well with others. Yep. And and I was in that kind of situation and, and second semester they made a change and uh because and then it got actually worse because the uh they asked me to move on and I was like, okay, and then the guy they got in had an even worse issue with overconfidence than I may have had. And he and the drummer, sometimes I heard they almost got into fisticuffs, you know. <laughs> Over so you, you mentioned a while ago, um, you know, memorizing that middle C as you go by. And it makes yeah. me think of one thing that I think a lot of bands can do who don't think about it is having their kids memorize. For us, typically it's B flat or right. even F. But, you know, if people do that, if they just have their kids start memorizing B flat 
And a lot of bands will start by singing B flat before they're ever allowed to play a note that oh, day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And That's it, a great it, idea. It, it's it's just an amazing thing that kids can do. Middle school kids can do. If you haven't tried that, they should. Um, yeah. But the uh, reason I thought of that is because you were in my band room once many years ago, and I learned a fact about you that I wanted to share. If people oh, don't, no. don't know this about Chris Berg, the nails on the chalkboard for Chris Berg is listening to oh, a yeah. band warm up, yeah. like hearing everybody play all the different things. You can't handle that. Yeah. Well, I I I. Try not to put myself in those situations. Yeah. And yet, and yet, the opening cut. Wait a minute, that's not the CD. Let's talk about the CD. The opening cut on the new CD starts out, first measure of the tune on the, on the it's published, it's Alfred. First measure of the tune says, make those obnoxious band room noises that you make before the band director comes in and tells you to stop. That's awesome. And that's what we did on the album, and and everybody just goes crazy, and it gets louder and louder and louder, and then just boom, the funk comes right out of it, what's, and what's, away we go. So you showed us, but for some people are watching, some people are listening oh. too. What's what's the name of the of the album? The name of the album is Perspective. Yep. You know, one of the things I learned about five years ago is everyone's got their own perspective on things. There's two sides, at least two sides to every story, and just some life experiences and realizing that my perspective wasn't the same as theirs, wasn't the same as his or hers. I mean, it was, you know, so that, that was the effect. And the opening cuts modern technology, which is uh, one of the chicken tunes. Yep. And uh, we even have my 11, she was 11. Then my 11 year old daughter plays on the album on her clarinet. She's a very nice clarinet player. And, uh, and I brought her in for that mass improv thing. At mm -hmm. the beginning, where everybody's just doing all their warm-up squeals and screams, and the trumpets are playing hot, louder, and the saxes are playing Charlie Parker licks, and you know, and the bass that's players not, playing. That's not what my band room sounds like. No, it's not. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> and she came in and did some great stuff on clarinet because growing growing up with me, she absolutely understands what improv is. Yep. So I said, "Honey, just just improv. Make up what you want." So she started playing what she wanted, and then she squeaked. And she just like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, do it some more. <laughs> I want more of the squeaks. But Miss Pilgrim says we're not supposed to squeak. Yes, but I want them. So she had to try That's and awesome. figure out how to make herself squeak again some more. So just to yeah. get that going on. So she's she's a uh, all her friends are quite impressed that she's at, at the time an 11 year old on a internationally released jazz CD. You know. So I don't I don't know out. much about this album. We're going to listen to some stuff from it. Um, your first album, you had some guest players on, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We had Wayne Bergeron and Clay Jenkins and and uh, and a bunch of, yeah. I, I always try to, you know, my I taught college 25 years and I got to know a lot of, a lot of the players in the industry. So, um, you know, I've built friendships and, and uh, gotten folks to, you know, hey, would you like to play? The second album we had Phil Woods on, you know, that was a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. And for Phil, it's the only time he ever played with my band. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's that bass confidence there, you know, but, <laughs> but he had a great, I mean, he loved it. He loved it. He really liked the tune. He really did a great job. Um, and then uh, this one has, is not, uh, not, not missing the guest artists. So we've got uh, Randy Brecker on there and Eric Marienthal. Oh, that's uh, it. Gen uh, what's that? That's it. <laughs> no. That's just to start, you're just, baby. You're naming some of the heaviest names out there. Yeah. Well, no, nah, Eric's kind of thin. No, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, and then uh, Greg Bissonette, the drummer who I went to, was actually in college with. Uh, his brother Matt and I were friends in college, and so I got to know Greg through Matt. And then uh, Bones Malone is on there. I've known Bones for, for 20 years, and uh, he's also a North Texas guy. And then, um, and then Sal Lozano, who... Most people may not know, but he's second alto in the fat band, unless Eric's not there, and then he's lead alto in the fat band. Mm -hmm. And he's a great player on all the woodwinds. And he uh, he does some flute and piccolo stuff for us on uh, the closing track, which is uh, an arrangement of Joe Henderson's Recorder May. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Sal just sounds incredible. Forgive yeah. me, uh, maybe I should have done this research, but I did not. Um... How many of the charts on there are published charts that people could play? Everything. Great. Everything's on there. The only one I haven't cleared, and, and I will get this cleared one way or another, is um, 
we do i do uh, an elvin jones crash and bash kind of arrangement of sponge which is a brecker brothers tune off of their heavy metal bebop album and uh we do it as an up-tempo swing chart instead of a funk chart and cool. uh randy loved it and uh what was super stoked to play on it you know and excited he loved the chart it, you know excited that it was on there um but everything else the only other one uh and i just got this taken care of yesterday is there's a uh an eric marienthal feature on footprints uh the uh wayne shorter tune uh but that one's cleared now and so that chart can be can be bought not dir- directly from me but i can steer people where where to do that and then several of the tunes uh are directly on my page on jw peppers i have a chrisberg jazz publishing page there and you can get them off of there and then uh record a may and modern technology are with alfred so your favorite vendor mm-hmm. and from a to z is with kendor and yeah those are those great yeah um one other thing i didn't prepare you for before we get into the the other stuff i love this um um Okay, so I'm not trying to say that bass is a simple instrument because it's not. But w- what's something on the bass that people don't realize is actually easy? Maybe like an easy trick that they could teach their school age bass player that would help them sound better. Um, maybe it could be like a harmonic language thing or maybe a technique that doesn't take a lot of knowledge to be able to teach or learn. Okay. Um, a couple of things I'll mention, easy things. Okay. okay. I had a. Uh, uh, band director posted a thing uh chicago area i want to say somewhere in the midwest northern midwest up there posted something and they made the comment you know listen to my bass player how great he's doing on this bass line and i asked um i asked the band director i said you know ha- or told the band director try having your student move his hand clo- his right hand the plucking hand unless yep. they're left-handed of course but the right hand closer to the bridge further away from the neck and play it again and see if it doesn't come out cleaner because if you're going to pluck hard which i do um and and i know there's there's a lot of players that play lighter than i do but if you're going to pluck really hard you need to move closer to the bridge so that there's more tension on the strings because what's happened is the students were were playing up toward toward the neck and we're getting a whole lot of distortion Mm -hmm. and a whole lot of fret rattle and and fret pop that wasn't necessary for that style. Now, if you're playing grunge, heavy metal type stuff, that absolutely is the style. You want that extra picky kind of click sound if you're not, especially if you're not playing with Bic. And so they recorded another thing with the hand further back. And it was like, man, now that sounds like a million bucks, you know, because they were bossa novas is what they were recording. And it was just kind of like, you know, so that's one thing. Um, Another thing on the bass to remember, uh, and it's it's similar with guitar, is it's completely a pattern oriented instrument. Sure. Now I'm ta- and both electric and up are upright, but on electric it's so easy to see the pattern. I mean, you it basically is like graph paper. You've got strings running left to right, and you got frets running up and down. So you learn a lick in B flat or a scale or a walking bass line in B flat and you want it in C, just move your whole hand up two frets, and now it's in C. And so um, take advantage of that. You know, when, when they're, you know, it makes it, you know, all of a sudden, oh, so I could play in the key of G flat because I just had to move my hand there and play the mm-hmm. same kind of things. Yep, absolutely, you can. And then, um, and then I see a lot of young bass players that work, really too hard on some things because you know like playing an a flat to a b flat and they've got their hand stretched so they can play the the a flat on the low e string and the b flat on the a string and it's mm-hmm. like you know if you just move your hand up to where you play the a flat with the first finger and the b flat with your fourth finger look how close that is and how easy it is on your hand and how clean it is not having to switch strings and yeah. just you know sometimes they they play things in awkward ways they just you just got to learn to embrace the patterns. Recently, you were uh, at Nevada Allstate, correct? Uh, well, twenty-one. yes, but what we're going to talk about was I was not at the Nevada Allstate. Right. 
but I did the Nevada Allstate. Right. So I got invited to do the Nevada Allstate and then COVID hit. And so they canceled all personal meeting kind of things. They didn't even have the music educator, jazz convention, none of that, that year and the year after. So I remember yeah, it. It wasn't yeah. fun. No, I heard, I seem to remember something about it. I read about it. Yeah. Anyway, I, I was going to say in the newspaper, but then, you know, not very many of us read those anymore. Yep. Um, but anyway, so they asked me what I wanted to do Zoom project with the Nevada Allstate kids that had made the band. And several, uh, she told me that several of the other conductors of other ensembles, not the jazz one, obviously, we're doing like, uh, let's get together and talk about, you know, rehearsal techniques or talk about playing a certain style or whatever. And I told her, I asked her if I could make them guinea pigs. And she said, explain. And I said, this is uh, Rochelle, the, the lady who is in charge. And I said, well, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to give the kids a 32 bar standard. It's, what, it's not a real standard, but it sounds like a standard. Uh, because of copyright issues. I said, I'd like to give the kids a 32 bar standard, teach them some basic arranging techniques. And over two Zoom meetings, the kids and I together will arrange a big band chart. They will arrange a big band chart. I will orchestrate it, make all the parts and send those to you. And then they made one, of, I call them those Brady Bunch videos that everybody came out oh, of yeah. Zoom. Oh yeah. All your friends record and then you splice all their little videos together and looks like the Brady Bunch went nuts. Um, and so that's what we did. So I sent him this little tune, uh, 32 bar tune follows a standard format, like a, like one of the old songs. And I taught them some basic arranging techniques. And then she had paired them up into pairs and I assigned them, I gave them parameters and I assigned them each eight to 16 bars of, some, of something to write and told, told them how to approach it and all of that. And then that was on a Tuesday night. And then they got everything to me by Thursday midnight. And by Saturday, I had taken all of the stuff that they had written and I had put it into a big band score and fully orchestrated it into a big band chart. Um, I, I One of the things I learned early on is that I had to not modify what they did because it wasn't my chart it was their chart yep there were a couple spots where some things they wrote i just honestly didn't feel were going to work so i proposed alternatives you know here's what you wrote here's what i think might be a little better do you like it do you don't like it and if they liked it we left it and if they didn't like it we put it back the way they had it i was okay with that because again it's not my chart it's theirs i'm just the orchestrator they're danny elfman and i'm the orchestrators okay uh for those of you that don't know who danny elfman is go look it up anyway of course, of course. um yeah so so then uh saturday i did the big reveal and that's the most fun part is um i show them like an eight bar section of the score and i say okay here's the melody you wrote and here's what it sounds like with just a rhythm section. And then here's, you know, say it was the sax soli. And then here's how I orchestrated the whole sax soli. I put in some little brass hits in between where you guys are taking breaths. And this is what your sax soli sounds like now. And I couldn't see them because on Zoom, if I've got my big score up, I don't see all their faces anymore. Yep. But uh, Rochelle told me, Rochelle Cowell told me that Oh my gosh. She said, you can't believe what their faces look like every time you did that little eight bar reveal. Cause I had everything hidden yep. and then I would just unclick the hide and it would all just jump up in their face and they'd be like, Whoa. And then they'd listen to it. She said, and her sweet comment when we were all done was this is the coolest zoom project I think I'll ever see. She said, I've been, I've been watched all the other all state projects and they were all great. She said, but this was so interactive with the kids. Mm -hmm. And then, so then once we did the whole reveal on Saturday, then by Monday mor morning, I had generated all their parts, sent them all PDF parts, sent her the PDF score, sent them the little MIDI demo. And over the course of the next two weeks, they had hired somebody to record it and make the video that you're going to see and everything. And they put it out. And now this is something that I've done with uh, a handful of high schools. And I did it with, uh, the Nebraska, the uh, Metropolitan Area Youth Jazz Orchestra at University of Nebraska in Omaha. 
uh, with Pete Matson. I did it with their ensemble and they premiered their chart at uh, the Gen Conference that year. Um, and it's, I, it's, it's such a great project. And here's the history behind the project. And I know I'm talking a lot, so I apologize. But when I was in high school, my junior year in high school, our band director taught a big band arranging theory class. He was a big jazz guy. He was associated with the Kenton Clinics, not as a player, but as an administrator, that kind of thing. And he loved big band jazz stuff. So he taught us this, this whole year of big band jazz theory. And at the end of the year, we wrote a chart. Everybody had a project to write their first big band chart. Mm -hmm. And only two of us finished it. And neither one of them were very good. But and part of my problem was, you know, the the music material that I picked was just so bad. It was a theme song for the Army Corps of Engineers in the mid 1970s. And it was a terrible ballad, so cheesy. And the tune <laughs> that the chart came out cheesy, too, you know, uh, go figure. But you know what it did? It lit this fire. To want to write something that other people play. And. and that connection between the composer and the performer, the communication of you putting something down on paper so that they can interpret it and either come up with exactly what you wrote or come up with their own idea of what you wrote. It's all magical. And it mm -hmm. just, I never stopped writing after that. I still have it. And if I can, you know, I love doing these. Uh, they, nobody has to fly me in to do this. It's not, it's cheaper than a commissioning a chart. It's so much interaction for the kids. They get to premiere it on a concert or whatever you want to do and say, you know, this is the world premiere of a chart that we wrote, you know, and the mm. kids just love it. And my hope is, you know, just as a writer and, and looking for ways to support myself is that, you know, I could get a handful of schools that would do this every three years because your jazz band turns over. And if you want to provide the same experience for your, those new kids, yeah, you do it again. Idea. And if if in the whole the whole realm of the thing, one or two kids go on and become writers, man. Yeah. Or if just you know if if one or two kids every time I do it becomes someone that gets as much joy out of writing as I do, then that's that's magic. I love, I love it. it. All right. So, well, so let's listen to it. Okay. So yeah, play it up to the solos, and then did you? Cue it up so that we can play the second half after solos, or I we can you. just get there. I got you. We I talked know, about this. Did. Yeah, we did. I know. All I'm right. just making you look like a, a, a miracle worker, you know. All right, here we go. Oh, what's the name of the tune? Uh, what did they call it? Uh, the, I think we just called it... Uh, 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 well, we called it the Nevada Jazz Project. All right. So uh, was the we'll whole thing. It. And yeah, let's just call it that for right now. All right, it's about two minutes, the, the clip that we're going to listen to. So here it is.
you know, for the kids, they're learning some very basic arranging techniques. Yep. And, and, you know, I just sent them a standard. You know, I, I, I'm calling it a standard. It's based on the changes to Dearly Beloved. Um, and it's just a, a melody, a new melody written to the changes. So how did they, uh, so say there's a trombone background. Right. Okay. Did like the uh, lead the lead player said, "Here's what I'm going to play," and everybody else harmonized with it, or? No, no, no. All they what the kids mostly wrote were um, melody lines. Okay. Okay. Because because here's here's one of the things I learned studying arranging in college. Everybody can learn the vertical. We can all learn to voice. You know whether you do spread voicings, you do close voicings. Uh, you know, you do parallel voicings like the Basie band did a lot, whether you do some of the unique voicing styles that Maria Schneider uses for all her dissonances and everything, you know, or you do what Brookmeyer does, you know, that kind of stuff. Everybody can learn to write voicings. Mm -hmm. What separates me from some of like, let's take some of the writers you have around there, Terry White, Craig Skeffington, what separates me from them or any of the other writers is what I put down that moves left to right. The melodies that I hear in my head. You know, I love listening to Craig and Terry stuff because it's like, wow, I never would have thought of that for a melody, mm -hmm. you know? And they're both trumpet players. Maybe I come up with a bass line and they're like, wow, I never would have thought of that as a bass line. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. But, yeah. but I'm saying that what we write left to right is what makes us different from other writers because the up and down can be learned. And so what I really worked on with these kids was left to right. Okay. I need, and, and I gave them parameters, like the first eight bars of the melody. I said, you know, here's some things that you can do to it. I gave them some, I taught them some basic techniques and then I need you to keep the ranges in this, you know, no higher than a uh, D above middle C, let's say, and no lower than D in the middle of the staff because we got to build the tune so that's where the melody needs to be for the first eight bars so every section that a pair of students had i gave them little parameters got and it. what to do to it. Got it and yes there were some hiccups you know there was the one trombone player who loved playing charlie parker stuff and so the melody was just like no we can't we, no no that won't work <laughs> can you simplify that and we probably did it about three times yeah before they came up with something and then it was busier yeah. than i would like but it reflected them and then, so yes, none of the harm, like the sax soli, the two gentlemen that wrote that, they wrote the melody and then I did the harmony. Got it. Uh, if, if something they wrote needed to be reharmonized with different chord changes or slightly different chord changes, I did that. Got it. Um, little brass hits in between those I came up with, but all the melody stuff, that's them. And that's why the chart sounds like what they think and not what I think. So we're going to kind of pivot here and listen to some of Chris's pieces. We have, sorry charts they're not pieces i apologize um, that's okay five pieces of music we're going to start with three that are newer uh, the first one is called unleash the chicken and this is chicken series number 23 tell us about it a little bit uh well before just the whole charts pieces you know um because i come from the jazz background but i'm now writing marching band shows for some schools and uh and i have a couple commissioned concert band pieces and stuff and i go in and call them charts and the kids all look at me like what <laughs> what's a chart you know anyway so yep. yeah anyway um okay so this is unleash the chicken um which uh the inspiration for the title oh i'm gonna say almost 10 years ago burger king came out with a chicken sandwich and had a t-shirt that said unleash the chicken and the school that i it was actually my old high school i was their guest artist slash adjudicator for their jazz festival that i actually help start when I was back in high school, they bought me one of these t-shirts and they all signed it. And then I saw the t-shirt and I was like, ah, feature chart title. You know, they, they just pop up everywhere. You know, people offer, you know, yep. I have different folks, you know, so, um, so tell us about it. Who's the publisher? So What's the great the level? publishers, Alfred. Uh, it's just out. It's uh, the newest of the chicken charts. I believe it's, it's 23. Um, and this time it's uh it's in a new orleans funk groove a second line kind of thing um it uses the loosely uses the chord changes from the original chicken chart mm -hmm. um and you know hence unleash the chicken so i'm kind of taking the chicken and going in a whole new direction with it the melody's different original it's got some 
some more stop time sections in it, uh, but it's a grade two. The ranges are all uh, 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 very accessible. And it's, again, the like the keyword I wrote down when I was making my own notes about this stuff, it's just meant to be a fun chart. And I think yep. it is, so. Yeah. All right. Um, before we listen to it, second line. Let, if people don't know what second line music is, what is that? What is it and what does it come from? Uh, New Orleans, uh, well, originally would come back, it would come all the way from uh, European marching bands, uh, goes into the New Orleans style of music where it gets mixed in with the jazz. So uh, if you go back to the uh, New Orleans funeral days where they would march the casket through the street. And there's an old James Bond movie with Roger Moore where this is actually like a big scene twice mm -hmm. in the movie. But as they're marching through the streets to the cemetery, the music's very slow. And then, but then on the way back, it's a party. Yep. And it's, and, that, and that's where this second line groove comes from. Sec, second line, if I'm not mistaken, refers to uh, in the old Dixie music, you had the front line, you had the second line. The front line were your clarinet, your trumpet, and your trombone, which then expand to our sax section, bone section, trumpet section as we go to modern big band. And the, the second line or the back line were the rhythm section players. So it's got a bit of a march feel, but with a, sw a swung eighth note. So you get that whole junt, gunt, gunt, to gun, dun, to junt, to gun, to gun, that kind of polyrhythm in there. You know, the, it's, it's actually a clave, a three, two clave pattern, yep. if you want. I mean, it's, it just, New Orleans, when jazz was kind of exploding there a, a century ago, it was such a melting pot. And, and a second line groove is, if you really think about it, it's a melting pot of a bunch of different styles. Yep. And then, uh, and it's just a identifiable st style. Um, I think I do a fairly good job of writing a, a basic groove for the drummer to pick up on, but there's mm -hmm. so many videos now that a drummer can get online and just, you just type in how to play a second line groove on a drum set. Yep. And you'll get 39 different drummers that you recognize the name all telling you how to play one. Tommy Igo, I think, is one of the ones that uh, that I often refer students to. He plays a second line groove because it can vary. Just like a swing groove can vary, a funk groove can vary. Every drummer has their own favorite twist sure. on a second sure. line groove. You know, I did. Uh, there's a Rick Hirsch chart called Beantown Blues Parade that's a grade one second line, and it has the easiest second line rhythm uh, written down, and it's it's brilliant. So anyway, you're right. There's nice. lots, lots of different options. Yeah. All right. Here's Unleash the Chicken.
All right. Um, and th there's another chart that we don't have on here that I, I we put out earlier. When was it? I don't know. Recently, a chart called Kick It, which is another New Orleans. Oh, yeah, yeah. Arizona. I like that yeah. chart. Yeah, that, um, that was a commission for a middle school band in Arizona. That's cool. And uh, the reference is uh, one of his... Uh, he, it's a middle school guy. He's working with lots of trumpet kids, and it's the third valve tuning slide. Kick it. That's awesome. That's, yeah, that's how he taught cool. him to to kick out that little finger and get that slide that valve or that slide out there to help that intonation. So gotta do it. That's where the title comes. From. And that's gotta one of the it. things I love doing when I do commissions. Um, you know, it should feel personal. Yep. So we we bantered back and forth about you know titles. You know, he had just taking the band to New Orleans. This is a school that's very much into the experiences for the kids more than like going to contests and things like that. Yep. So they had just gone to, I think it was the Gen Conference in New Orleans. So we were talking about kicking it on Carondelet. Mm -hmm. You know, we we left all references of Bourbon Street out because that might get go the of wrong course. way. But mm -hmm. kick it's what we came up with. And that, a lot of fun too. And New Orleans street music is such a fun groove. It's fun it to write, it you is. know, so. Um, all right, so our next chart is a bassy style ballad, sort of in the in the realm of Little Darling. It's called "If I Gave My Heart." So that was uh, if I gave my heart. Uh, it's a like you said earlier. It's a bassy style. 
ballad in the realm of Little Darlin' or I Left My Heart in San Francisco, you know, those kind of tunes. So it's, I think it's a great chart for, it's a, I think it's a 1.5. Um, the ranges are really mild. Uh, it's great for teaching uh, ensemble because the horns are either, for the most part, horns are playing unisons or they're playing 2D and they're all doing the same rhythms together. So you get a lot of working on different concepts. Laying back, um, articulation, yep. all the things. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, style, ensemble, dynamic control, because the chart never really gets loud. It gets mm -hmm. to a nice forte, but it shouldn't be like a screaming loud forte. Uh, a lot of the chart is mezzo piano, um, just because it's that ballad kind of concept. And there's no improv needed. Yeah. Um, and yet, uh, one of the things that I did, because a lot of times when I work with the younger bands that this chart would be for, they have a piano player that can read because they have all these years of studying piano private lessons. You know, they started when they were three or whatever, but they're very immature with the jazz stuff. So giving them chord changes and say, make up a solo, probably not going to happen. But this chart has all kinds of piano fills between ensemble melody and it almost is like a piano feature mm -hmm. you know but it's this kind of thing that basie would do behind the band you know a lot of times because he had freddie green going he didn't worry about playing the chords he just would play you know his little um you know yeah. that kind of thing or whatever you know um, and one thing that T Terry and I just did a, a, a series, a six part series on all yeah, this. Rap. Yeah, yeah, it's a great and, series. And, and one thing, well, well thank you. Um, one thing that Terry and I always agree on is that like the grade level doesn't matter, you know, and I'm right. sitting here as a band director who, you know, my kids play anywhere from grade one to maybe four. Right. Um, but like this grade, will you call it a grade one and a half? It doesn't even matter if what it is, if it's right. good music. And it would be yeah. beneficial oh, for your absolutely. kids. So many people are into like, well, we have to play this. So people right. need to be flexible on the grade level. Yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, yeah. You know, now, and, and different grade level charts can be for different purposes. Yep. You know, um, you know, you've got to do a concert with the just the jazz band. So now you got to play fifty minutes. Well, you're not going to have the time to put together eight or nine grade five charts yeah you know but if you can find some easier charts that are good music hallelujah yeah no all right let's but, let's let's go to the next chart this one's called okay. Cro crossroads yep. tell us a little bit about it this is written for a uh a private christian high school in uh the oklahoma city area and um and he just you know he loves my writing um i've written several things for him i just wrote a funk chart on hallelujah chorus that they play now at their graduation ceremonies uh because the jazz band plays their graduation ceremonies mm -hmm. so as soon as they say you know welcome to class of 2023 you know and off we go mm -hmm. um so uh so i wrote this for uh for this band um it, it's it's a swinger it's a little up tempo uh it is a challenge but the ranges are modest and it kind of goes back and forth between modal and uh and then uh some bebop two five ones but it's i think improv wise it's a great learning thing because the modal allows them to focus on just one or two scales over that sure. section sure and then the bebop section if you listen to it the bridge is like two five one and e flat two five one and d two five one and d flat two five one and now we're back to c again yeah so then it allows them you know they can take a lick you know we we're talking about the bass players and i know it's not just a pattern for the horn players, but you can take the same lick that works over one and down a half step and down a half step and down a half step. And now, so it provides a lot of opportunities to learn. And, and I just wanted to throw this in here too. Uh, we've mentioned this on prior podcasts, but if people are new to this, when we say two, five, one, I think we talked about, so if you're in C like D minor G or G seven and C right in the basic right. way, yep. but wh why that's so important is two, five, one is all basically one major scale. So, we, yep, you know, exactly. we call that a key center. And then if so, if you're analyzing chord changes for your own band and you see like F minor and then B flat seven and then E flat, well, you can have them play the entire E flat scale over all of yep, that. Exactly. So for people who don't know that, that's a sort of a big thing that when I learned that, that like changed my my uh, teaching. So, yep. All right. Let's listen to it. Here's Crossroads.
right. Next chart is called a water's edge. At water's edge. Yeah. At it's, um, water's edge. Yeah. It was written for an honors band in the, uh, the Maryland area. And it's a kind of a, that contemporary straight eighth note floaty Matheny influenced kind of tune. Uh, it's got some nice orchestral hints behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, a very haunting melody, I think. Obviously, you like the chart because you wrote it, but you know, tell us what do you like about that? Well, I, I, I do like the chart, and yes, because I wrote it. Uh, I think it's a great um, contest piece. When Metroplexity, my big band, uh, when we go out and do festivals, I don't typically do a traditional ballad. Um, I try to keep, you know, we're only going to do a forty-five minute set, hour set. I want to keep it high en higher energy. So this is to me is the perfect alternative to a traditional ballad. Mm -hmm. It's got intimacy without being quarter note equals 60. That kind of and I'm nothing against ballads, don't get me wrong. I just that's just me, you know. But you're uh, smart. And, I mean, there's a lot of times you hear big bands play for school age kids who've been at all state for twelve hours right. and then they play ballads at nine o'clock at night. So yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a place for that. So this is a good alternative. Like if you were going to a like typically the contests around here, if you're competing, you're, you're going to do a fast tune, a slow tune, and a fast tune. This could be used as a slow tune. Um, it, it, I'm really proud of it. It won two. Uh, the whole album has won five Global Music Awards, which is an international wow. awards thing that you apply to and send off recordings and they judge and so forth. And this one won two of them, for one for performance, one for composition. Um, I stole an idea from a, several of Fred Sturm's charts. 
And, and this is one of the things I think that makes this chart cool for your students is each of the two soloists have different solo sections. The tenor sax, no, the trumpet has a solo section based on the chord changes of the tune. And the tenor sax goes back and forth between two chords. But all of the solo sections can be played with a C melodic minor scale. Hmm. All of the chords are derived from C melodic minor. So like an E flat major sharp 11, you know, uh, sharp five that, you know, it's all the chords. So, and yes, they can approach it in many different ways, but the student, the younger student, when I use this with all, with uh, honors bands, the younger student, I just cue them in, learn this one scale. Mm -hmm. And it's a very hip scale. You know, it's one of the hip, it's a hip sound and scale. Immediately, these young kids sound like they've been playing jazz for like 10 years. It's great. Because they're getting way beyond the major scale sound. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with the major scale sound. And, and it's just one scale. And so, so that was one of the brilliant things, uh, many brilliant things about Fred Sturm. I love his writing. But I was like, ooh, that's a cool idea. I'm going to do that. You know, now my guys on the recording... <laughs> You know, they're they're yeah. often wherever they want to go. But for a young band, I, I just think that's just a great positive of this chart. Uh, ranges are pretty modest. It's got a lot of drama to it. Um, I just think it's it's a I like it. Obviously, I put it on the album, so I like it. And yeah, it's and probably Murphy. probably not as hard a chart as we would typically play on an album. But I just liked it that much. So, yeah. And we're featuring it here, which means we really like it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's and, on and, that's on the album, as is the last tune that we're going to do called Perspective. Yep. Yeah, and this is a title cut. Yeah. And this started out. We talked earlier about you know me with bass lines, right? Right. So if can you hear the piano when I'm banging on it? Yeah. Okay. So so if you listen. <laughs> heart mm -hmm. okay that's that's the baseline from owner of a lonely heart by yes hmm. and and i turned it into an ostinato for bass trombone and bass and then did a different kind of harmony over the top than what yes did and that became the basis for the whole first half of this chart and and it and and you know the idea of perspective this is a very contrapuntal chart so it, if you're looking at it for educational purposes it's going to teach your your horn sections independence mm -hmm. okay because th that idea that you've got to listen to the people that are playing what you play but don't listen to the people that aren't playing what you play and developing that you know that kind of thing because the chart starts out with one line and then goes up a half step and another line gets in and up a half step and another line gets introduced so there's a lot of that going on and then you know i i tell my arranging students this all the time we are products of what we listen to. Mm -hmm. All right. It, it seeps in. If you're a musician, you're a, you have to be a product of what you listen to. Well, I was halfway through this chart and I was really stuck. Like, I don't know where to go after the solos. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I was going through a binge of watching B sci-fi movies, mm -hmm. things like giant gator versus mega shark sharknado things like that and this one movie shot in new zealand and and the pseudo classical music that's going under the intro had this rhythmic thing going on and i was like oh that's cool and man it's even like the right tempo so immediately i turn the movie off and i run into the office and i start beating out this rhythm and coming up with my own chords to go with it and then put more contrapuntal stuff over the top and borrowed some techniques from another of my favorite writers, Kim Richmond on the West Coast, where he does stuff. And like he'll do contrapuntal lines. And instead of when they meet being on happy thirds and fifths, they'll be on ninths and sevenths and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you get all this dissonance, you know. And so that's what happens after the solo section. It goes into this pseudo classical kind of thing. And it just it just turned out to be a lot of fun. So I love that's it. what this is. All right, let's listen to it. Here's perspective.
uh, it's just so great to listen to all of your music, Chris. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks. I had fun too. You know, this wasn't as painful as you said it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> people want to reach out to you i'm sure they can do so very easily chrisberg jazz and chris with a k right yep yeah so the website's www.chrisbergjazz.com um you can there's the email on there to contact me phone number to contact me even if you want to mail me a letter you can contact me the coolest thing is the third cd is just out now and we've got it worked out on the website like we're behind the times but you can actually download tracks directly from my website now. Cheaper than Apple, cheaper than you uh, wherever you download stuff from. Yep. So you want to, you know, you don't get all the good stuff. You don't get the the twelve page novel that goes with it with all the cool <laughs> pictures and everything. But if you just want the tracks, you know, they're ninety nine cents a pop, and uh, you or you can download the whole thing. So there, uh, that's one of the cool things we're about. And as Craig Skeffington would say, I'd be. Uh, I'll be rolling in my tens of dollars pretty soon. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.